So he is a, a trained psychotherapist. He works uh, now with the homeless. He died, uh, and we'll get into that in a moment, but it was a very strange death in that he was young at the time that he died with a, a young family. Okay. Well, like you said, I, ha I have a rare autoimmune disease. I have, I have quite a few of them. I, I developed them after being exposed to toxic chemicals in the military. And, you know, I won't go into all the details that led up to, to when I actually had my cardiac arrest. There's just, it was a lot of in and out of the hospital, you know, chronic end-stage heart failure, and it came on really quick. But um, in January of 2017, that's when I, I started to go into this, this really severe arrhythmia, and my heart rate was just below what I had a defibrillator put in, and it was just below the threshold, so it wasn't shocking me out of it. But it was it was still really intense, and I, I was feeling that you know something's wrong, and I, I knew I had to call the ambulance. So they took me to the hospital, and for seven hours they were trying to to stabilize me. And all this time I knew I was going to die. I just I knew this was different than the other times, and that I could just feel my body dying. And they ended up stabilizing me enough that they thought they could move me up to the ICU. Um, they were, you know, the ER was filling up. So they got me into the ICU. But as soon as they transferred me from the ER bed to the ICU bed, the arrhythmias went really high. And they called the code blue, had the crash team come in. And, you know, my room suddenly filled up to, you know, almost 30 people. I mean, it, 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 that might be an exaggeration. It was a, it was a small room. You've been in those hospital rooms that it was full. There was a lot of people and there were people coming in and out, people that were outside that were helping to pass things in and out. And, but it was real chaotic. You know, they were asking me a lot of questions like, hey, what's your name? What's your address? Things I knew they already knew. So at this point, I knew it must be getting really bad. You know, they don't call code blue for nothing. But when they're asking me those questions, I, I know they just wanted to keep me present and keep me with them. Uh, you know, they kept calling out like certain organs were failing. My liver had failed. My kidneys were failing. My lungs were giving out. And, you know, I have scar tissue in all of those organs from the disease. But it, it, it was unbelievable all that was happening. And so I just laid back and I closed my eyes and I, I thought, you know, I just want to die. And I prayed to God. I'm like, I'm done fighting. I've never quit anything in my life. But this time I just, I had had enough. I, I said, God, I just spare me of this. Take me out of this. I can't deal with it anymore. And, you know, I, I, I was super comfortable at that point with just dying. I, I really wanted it. And I, I didn't answer any more questions. The doctors were asking me all kinds of those questions. Then I, I said, you know, I'm not answering anymore. And that was it. And it was hard to get that out. I, I, I mean, it was a force of my own strength just to, to be able to get those words out. And as I did, I, I just said, I'm ready. And as soon as I had said that, you know, it, I felt this shake and this pop. And I could feel my soul actually leaving my body. And immediately, all the noise, all the chaos, everything, all the pain, everything was gone. There were no negative emotions. I just felt like this rush of love enter into my soul. And I'm looking at this, this dark void as I'm feeling this rush come in. And I, I'm seeing that you know I could, I could look into this dark void. It looked kind of like outer space but it didn't have all the stars and the planets and all that. And I, I thought, well, this can't be it. You know, I, I, I just, I, I could feel this love, but I, I, I couldn't imagine that, that that was all there was, was this big dark space and a bunch of love. And as and soon as I, I said that, I realized that I could see into this dark void. So there must be something that's shining into it. But I also could see, which I didn't realize how my abilities for my sight had changed, but I was seeing in 360 degrees. So I could see every which way around me. And so I realized there's a light behind me and it was a magnificent light, really bright, large, beautiful light. And that is exactly where the love was coming from. It was just permeating into my soul. It was, it was tangible. It was a palpable kind of love. It wasn't just like, you know, you, you love somebody and you say it in life, you know, it, it, and you, you kind of believe it, sure. But this was, there was no doubt that this light was what was loving me. Now, at this point, I'm realizing, I'm like, wow, God is love. All love comes from him. There is no love that, that doesn't exist without God. And 
I could feel that. And, you know, my intelligence went up like, like you couldn't even believe. As soon as I died, I, could, I, was, I was instantly smarter. I, I knew things that I had never even had any kind of access to in life. So there was, there was just like, even time was, was so magnificently different there than it is here because there was no time. It, it, there was no concept of it. It was as if everything that ever happened in eternity was in this little tiny pinpoint. Like everything was there and I had access to anything that I, I wanted to look at. And it was all there at once without being chaotic, which just <laughs> blows my mind still to this day that I, I could sit there and look at, you know, I didn't look at your life, but I could have, it, you know, it was all right there. And, and it's kind of off in the periphery, but what I was looking at and focusing on is what, get, what grabbed my full attention. And so I was able to, to, to isolate all those different things and still be able to focus on the one thing at this, at, at, that I really wanted to do. And that's where I was laying down all these new memories while I was actually dead, which is still, again, it blows my mind away. And so, you know, I'm, I, I, as soon as I saw this light, I t turned to it and I, I was just drawn to the light. It was it wasn't like I was forced to come to the light. I w there, was no, there was nothing saying, hey, you know what, get over here. You got to come this way. It was as if my soul knew I belonged there. Like, like this was the one place that was really home. You know, I can't sleep really well in other places. At home, I can sleep just fine. But this is what I felt like. It was like beyond what it feels like to sleep at home. This was, this was like just the, the most welcoming, loving place you could ever imagine. And and it was light. I just, I, it blew my mind away. So I, I said, I want to be with that light. And as soon as I said that, I was there standing right before this light. But what was interesting is that I, I remembered every single step I took to get there. So it, it happened so quickly, but yet there's no way I could have all that much memory in that period of time. It just, it, the whole time thing just throws you off. But so I, I'm, I'm standing there before this light and, you know, my, my vision, not only could I see all these different directions, you know, and everything all at once, but I, I could see far. And so this light was extremely vast. I mean, it went so far to the left, I couldn't see the end of it. And I could watch my vision as it was, you know, trying to seek out the end. I, I could never find the end. So I looked to the other side, no end there and up and down, same thing. So I, it was just absolutely all encompassing. This light was just massive. And I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm saying, I can't believe this light doesn't hurt my eyes. And you know, like I said, I knew this was God, but it was, but I didn't see like a body. So I didn't see, you know, a, a, a facial feature or anything like that. So I don't know if it was just God's glory that was, was, was this light or, or what part of him. I don't want to try to, you know, say all those kinds of things, but I know this was emanating from God or was God or something along that line because this was definitely God. This was this was him interacting with me. And I'm I'm looking at it and I and as soon as I, you know, I said I couldn't believe that this is that this isn't hurting my eyes, you know, God says, Well, do you want to come in? You know, and says, Come on in. So I, I was like, Well, yeah, I'm going in. So he said he invited you. Oh, do absolutely. you want to come in? Yeah. <laughs> It was, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was amazing because I, I wanted to, but I, I you know, I, I get really happy when I talk about this and, and, and that doesn't, I don't want to try to downplay the sovereignty of God because I was so respectful and, you know, it was like my soul was genuflecting to God. I, but yet he was so warm and welcoming. It, it's, it's like my feelings and my emotions now are just so happy and, and enjoying and like they were then, but it was also this, just this awe. I was like in complete awe of God. And, you know, people always say that, you know, you should have a fear of the Lord. And if he was mad at me, I, I would have really been afraid because I, I realized he could do whatever he wanted, but he's so gentle and so kind and, and forgiving. His mercy was just so wonderful. But when I started to go in, it, I, I felt like this love was going in at an even faster pace and more powerfully into my soul. It kind of felt like, you know, like a straw when you're drinking from a straw and, you know, it's never empty. You're, you're drinking, it goes from one place into the other. And, 
know, that's what it kind of felt like is like his love was going into me and then it was flowing back out into heaven and kind of just recirculating. It never went away. It never was gone, but I never was emptied. It was like, I was just constantly being filled with his love. And what he was doing is he was like shaving off all these ugly pieces of me, like all this hurt, all these, you know, like that, just the fact that I had just died in a, in a pretty horrific death. I didn't go into all the details, but it was I mean, seven hours. It's a, I, I'm still have some trauma from that. You know, it was a terrible death, but he was shaving that off. So it was like, wow, he's, he's healing me from anything. I didn't even care about dying. I didn't care about any insults or hurts that I had once cared about, you know, all that stuff was gone. And so I'm walking through, through this light and I said, well, I want to see Jesus. And as soon as I said that, this, it opened up, the light just opened up and there was this massive room. And it was so cool because in this room, there were like, I don't know how many beings it was. I've never seen a trillion, but I would bet it, it was a trillion. I could say it, it was any number that you could think of that was just so vastly large that you couldn't even con have a concept of it in your mind. It was just a lot of beings, but there was this one being that was clearly, it was Jesus. There was my mind. I knew who it was right away. There was nobody, nobody had to explain it to me. Nobody had to tell me, hey, hey, over here, here, that's Jesus. You know, they didn't have to do that. It was obvious that, that this was Jesus. But all these beings had like, they kind of looked like um, under a set, under a microscope, you know, you look at cells and they got all those little moving parts that are around, but those moving parts are like brilliant light, beautiful just light that was just emanating from these beings. But, but Jesus, now he, his light was so vastly, it was the same light as what I had saw when I first got there. It was just this beautiful light and it was reflecting out. And it was, you know, I felt the love coming from all over from, from the light of God, from Jesus. And the atmosphere was like a pinkish kind of green. And and it was, it was alive. I, 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 pinkish green is kind of a poor description because I don't really understand what colors they were, but that was about as close as I, I can come. But it was, it was, I, that was the Holy Spirit. I could feel that, that he was connecting everybody to Jesus and God. And, and then all the beings were all connected together too. And it was, it was this, this just kind of collective consciousness that was happening. And I, I, I was standing there looking at Jesus and it, it was, it was just so wonderful to, to be able to see him and, and to, to know. And I said, I want to see your face. And as soon as I said that his face started to come together. So it went from this, this light just emanating from him. And as soon as his face came together, all the other beings were apparent to me too. So I could see everybody that was there and, but they, they stayed off in my periphery. So I, I was, completely fixated on Jesus. I, I, people always will ask me, Oh, did you see grandma there? Did you see so-and-so there? And, you know, I, I believe I know who I saw there, but it's those memories aren't as clear as what I saw with Jesus. Cause that's what I was focusing on. And so I'm, I'm looking at Jesus and his face was like, just so beautiful. And it was smiling but I couldn't remember it. Like as soon as it got to my eyes, I knew I was seeing his eye or his face, but I didn't have a memory of it. So every time that that image came in, there was no memory being laid down. So I wasn't having anything to draw back upon. So I couldn't even in my head, I couldn't see what his face looked like in my head. It looked like just brilliant light, like just this flash of light that just was constantly permeating into my, into my brain. And but I could see that he was smiling. So it was, it was kind of a hard thing that maybe, maybe I don't do a good job explaining it, but it was, it was fantastic to me anyway, because he was just so wonderful. And the whole time I'm looking at him, I'm going through my own sins. I'm going through everything that I had done in life. And you know, all those memories that I said were in that pinpoint, I was pulling them up. I was like, wow, I did this. And I could see how I hurt those people, how it hurt me, but I could also see how it hurt Jesus. And to me, that was just, it, it was devastating in a way because, you know, I'm seeing just this, this, this ripple effect of my, of my sins, things that I had done or hadn't done. And some of those were the worst things because, you know, like I said, I confessed a whole bunch of sins, but 
the ones that I didn't didn't recognize, the ones that I you know even justified. I thought, well, I was right. This person was you know rude to me, or they did this to me, and you know so I I have the right to defend myself. I still saw what I had caused in that life, or or what it, it did to Jesus was really what what was impacting me because I felt his pain for that person, and so I, that was a really eye opener for me. You know, I didn't feel like he was condemning me. I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, the whole time he kept smiling at me. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I realized he was forgiving me, but it was even more than just that forgiveness. It was, it was again, that shaving off those ugly pieces. It, it was, it was the healing process, you know, because like even those things now, I still feel bad for, I don't want to do them again. It's, it's as if he, he did a curing and on a lot of things that I, I had held on to for so long, so many resentments that now are just gone. I, I, that's the one thing that I think is so hard to really explain because, you know, you have to know me, you have to know what I knew inside of me. And, you know, I, I, we all have our own little bubbles. We don't let people get into the deepest parts of us. But that was the most mind blowing thing is that these resentments, angers that I had had for long years, those were gone. He, he was taking those things away. So while I was seeing how it hurt him, and I, this was more of a, a, a judgment on myself, but it wasn't even as if I was judging myself, is that I was acknowledging that I don't want to do those things, that I don't want them to be part of my life. And again, Jesus was smiling at me the whole time, but it's his smile. His smile is so healing it's like medicine it's whenever i have a bad day i sit there and meditate on the on his smile i just meditate wow. on and the only thing i can remember of it now is that bright shining light but it's so comforting to me to because i can i can remember it like i'm still standing there looking at him it's wonderful wow and and so i i you know i i'm looking at him and, and as we go through all of those, those sins and he's just smiling the whole time you know, I, I, I realized I'm dead. And I said, well, you know, at, at six years old, I had prayed to you and I asked for a, a long life because I had saw my great grandmother's funeral and all my aunts and uncles and all these people I love were, were crying because she was really beloved. And so I didn't want to be the cause of so much misery at that age. I was like, please, God. And, and that was you know, six years old. That's, that, I mean, I prayed for a long time, an hour, maybe even longer. But I mean, a six-year-old to do that, that's, I, I don't know of a lot of six-year-olds that sit there and pray that long. I'm sure there are some, but this was like a really yeah. heartfelt prayer. And then all of a sudden I felt that rush of like peace come over me where you know that your prayer had been answered. And I just, I, was this in heaven with, as a six-year-old that you were seeing this? Or? No, no, no. I didn't, I didn't see him then. It, uh -huh. I, just, I just had that feeling like he had interacted in my life and answered that prayer. But yes. while I was asking him, as I was standing before him now at 42, I, I, he, I asked him, I said, well, do you remember that? And he said, yeah, I remember that prayer. And it still stands. So he had answered it. I, that I, knew, I knew he had, but he confirmed that he had. So he, he said, yeah, you, it still stands. And then he asked me, but why would you want to go back? And, and it wasn't like, you know, trying to talk me out of it. It was, he wanted me to think about what was my reason for going back. And, you know, I, I reflect on this a lot. And I think it was because he didn't want me to go back for the wrong reasons, things that are still out of my control. And I, the first thing that popped in my head was my family. And, you know, he's, he's patient, he's loving, and he's got a sense of humor. And he's like, well, you know, everything you did in life, you, you know, I, I was still there helping you the whole way. Don't, don't kind of pat yourself on the back because it wasn't, it wasn't you that that's going to get them to heaven, you know, and that's, that's kind of the, the thing that I really, really had to recognize is that, you know, my, my kids, yeah, they might, you know, do better with me here, but he still loves them every bit as much as he loves me. And so that realization, you know, when he, he was saying that he loves my family and he wants to take care of them, it was, it was as he was teaching me that my reason to come back can't be solely for my family. I get to enjoy that anyway. That's, that's a benefit of coming back. So I was really starting to think, and I, I realized well, I could do more for him. And, and it was this 
like strong desire. It really resonated with me. And that's when he said, yeah, that's it. And, you know, I knew that's what I want to do. It wasn't even for me to, you know, come back and, and live, live for him and then, you know, die with more glory or something. I didn't even care about that. I just wanted to, to love him as I was feeling his love. It was almost uncontrollable that I, I just wanted to do this for him. And so he starts to tell me about how there are three things that I need to do then. And, and those three things are so important for me. It was that I need to pray more. And he was telling me that I need to pray more because that's how I keep my relationship with him. And so that, that made sense. But then he says that I needed to suffer joyfully. And part of this was is that there wasn't going to be this miraculous healing for me that I was going to have to come back and still suffer. And that, you know, I had to be prepared for that. But it was also that as I'm seeing, you know, God who came down, took on human form and suffered for us, and he's smiling and, and happy, I realized what suffering joyfully was for a greater purpose, you know, and we, we have to have some kind of purpose to our suffering. And I have a purpose now because of that interaction. I don't know that I would have been able to do that suffering joyfully without that, unless I had that, that knowledge of what I'm doing, that purpose. And, you know, he gave me that purpose. And so that became pretty easy. And then the last thing he told me to do was to share his love. Mm. And that, that's, is something that, that still, you know, I, I, I find so appealing because that's exactly what I wanted to do when I was there is I wanted to, to just give him love. I wanted to show him love and live for him. And what better way than to try to show love to others. And, and he, and with that, he gave me this, this wonderful insight and grace to that. I just don't want to hurt anyone in any way. He, he changed a lot of things for me where somebody will say something and you know, I'm still human. I, I, I still might say something that isn't quite as kind or maybe in, a little impatient at a time, but I'm quick to, re, re, to apologize, you know, to recover from that. So he, he really did help me even with how to share his love because it's those those little interactions, you know, not recognizing something or doing something that we're just, you know, we don't really count as being that bad. So it's not so high on the scale, but he was teaching me how to, how to actually do those things. And then he said that I had to go back. And at this point, it, it was the only time that I felt any kind of discomfort while I was there. And it was more and more intense every step I took away from Jesus. And so as I'm going back, and I had to go back the exact same way that I came in. So I, I go through the light and, you know, the pain's growing and growing. But then I, I see my tunnel. And this is something that I do kind of mention, but I don't really, like I said, everything else is in the periphery. So I didn't have to have anybody, you know, have a sign or something that said, hey, this is Brian's tunnel. I knew which one was mine. It was quite intuitive. So there so are I, different tunnels that you're seeing. It seemed like that to me. Mm -hmm. I. I, so that's the one thing that I, I it, like I said, it's in the periphery, so I, but I still have that, that vision of it. But it's, it's you know, I, I don't trust it as much as I do that, that my tunnel. I saw my tunnel for sure. So I went into my tunnel, and at the end of my tunnel was no longer that dark void. It was my hospital room, and I could see my body, and it was as if I was looking at my body kind of from up here, so I'm, I'm looking at, at the hospital room and I'm seeing all the faces of the, of the hospital staff that were in there. And they had this big green machine on my chest and it was doing chest compressions. And I later learned it's called a Lucas machine. And so I, you know, I had never seen one of those things before. So I, I was kind of interested in that anyway. And you know, the way it was moving was kind of bizarre. You know, you've seen your body there. And, and so I, I, I was approaching this and all of a sudden they took that off. And then I, you know, I don't know if they were calling it at that point because I had been dead for over 10 minutes. So I don't know what point they were going to call it, but it, it might've been at that point because they took that, that machine off. But then when I, I got to my body, I didn't have to have any kind of explanation. It just, I, I naturally knew how to get back into my body, just went into it. And as soon as I did, I spontaneously revived and I, I popped up like this 
and that poor doctor, I don't know what he was, what he was thinking or what went through his mind, but this looked like he just got this startled look. And I said, did I just die? It was, you know, kind of hard to, to, to talk because they had tubes in my mouth and they had, you know, a lot of stuff or not, not necessarily in my mouth, but they had a, what is that? A mask with a tube and they were doing some oxygen and stuff like that. So they, uh, they ended up having to come down to me. The doctor came right down by my, by my face and I said it again, did I just die? And I knew I had just died, but I didn't, I didn't, you know, I had never believed in NDEs and I didn't, you know, didn't believe in, you know, uh, kind of out of body experiences. I didn't believe in those things. I thought it was more of like neurotransmitters being released, you know? And so I, I, I didn't have that kind of knowledge, but I knew I had died and I wanted just to, have the doctor tell me, yeah, we know you just died too. So you know, he leans in, he's like, yeah, you just died. <laughs> so so that, I think he was very relieved that I popped back in and came back to life. But the, the charge nurse was really interested in, in asking me a lot of questions and a whole bunch of things, but she wasn't so interested in, in what had happened while I was dead. She was just asking a lot of questions. So I, but I only wanted to talk about, well, guess what I just saw and you know what happened. And I don't know that she was a believer, and yet she ended up telling everybody else because all that week that I was still in the in the ICU, people were coming in from different floors. They were, I mean, there were nurses and other people that were coming in asking me to tell them what had happened. And you know, I was I was cool with that because it was it was fun to to share my experience. But I I remember that as they were working on me, because I had to get prepped to go to emergency surgery, they had to put in a new pacemaker and defibrillator up here because the one that was on my side was, you know, it had a lot of problems. It was too powerful and it wasn't shocking me at the threshold that they wanted it to be. So they just needed a different device. In. And the pacing was great because that was, you know, gave them more flexibility in how to control my heart. You know, a lot of times I think in life, people sacrifice a lot of things for ambition. You know, I want to be good at my job. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with being good at your job. But our job usually is the last thing that we sacrifice. Family will come before our job. So we'll sacrifice family and friends and things like that. And those relationships, you know, had, had suffered while I was still living that, that life before I died. And because, you know, I put so much time and effort into you know, building a career that I could support my family. So it was kind of a a tough road, but my son, he, he was just so impressed with how everything changed. And, and it was all about love. I, I just, I just feel this immense love in me. And of course I want to show it to my family first and foremost, cause you know, I, I have a human love for them beyond just loving my neighbor. But now I have this love for my neighbor that I don't look at people when I, when I see people, I don't look at them and say, well, they're doing this or they're doing that. I, I get what they're doing. I do take that into account, but I always try to think, how can I get this person to heaven? How can I be an instrument that that one piece that helps them or doesn't at least impede them in this interaction? Because you know, loving my neighbor isn't about you know just giving food to the homeless or you know or just giving somebody a ride who needs a ride. It's not just doing good deeds. It's it's about actually caring about that person's well-being of their soul. And sometimes people are going to say rotten things to us. And my son has seen, seen this quite often, that people will say some really rude things. And, you know, I just kind of smile or walk away or whatever I think is going to be the best thing to diffuse the situation. But I don't respond. I don't get, you know, back in the day, I would have, I'd have been like, well, listen, you're not going to talk to me like that. And I'm going to tell you all the horrible things about you. And, you know, I'm going to defend myself. But now it's, it's like, well, that isn't going to help that person get to heaven. I'm going to just keep my mouth shut. And to be able to swallow your pride like that, but it, it's, it's not coming from me. It's this grace from God, because when I do it, I have to actively take that, that work. I, have to, I mean, it's work. I have to say, okay, I'm not going to say anything. But as soon as I do, and I just give it up to God, all of a sudden he gives me this grace of humility where it becomes sweet for me to do that. It's no longer unpleasant. But I have to actually do the, the action of saying, I'm not going to say a thing here. I'm going to actually swallow my pride and, and just try to do what's best for them. And then I feel better about it. So he, he even rewards that, that activity. So the place I'm working at now, it's, it's actually 
a, a church that has a treatment program. And so they do housing, they, they supply all the needs for, for these homeless people. And these clients are, are benefiting from that. And to me, that's, that's what drew me to this is that, you know, I want to be in a place where I can, can comfortably share and help people because there's so much more to the human being than simply just this material matter.